So in this video, we're going to talk about what it means to be alive. So biology is a study of life, and so it's, of course, important that we understand what it makes something living. Before we can do that, we need to understand that there are similarities between living things and non-living things. Most importantly, living things have to obey the same laws of physics and chemistry as everything else. So living things have to obey the law, Newton's laws of motion, and they have to obey the law of gravity, and they have to obey the law of thermodynamics. Additionally, living things and non-living things are made up of the same elements. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, these are, all thing, these are all elements we find both in life as well as in just everyday objects. So most of this video is going to be about talking about the characteristics of living things, but there's a couple uh, components we need to understand of that. The first of which that not all, is that not all of the characteristics of life are unique to life. Uh, so, for example, one of the characteristics of life is the need to maintain stable internal conditions. A computer has to do that. A computer, if you have too much energy input or too much, too little energy, or if it gets too hot, will turn off and, and stop functioning. And so those things aren't unique to life. It's also important you note that as you go through your educational career, especially those of you taking additional biology classes in the future, you may find these terms listed a little differently or in different quantities. Uh, the reason for that is that each book groups them differently. I don't even know if I'm grouping them the same exact way the book does, but the, the intent and the heart of all the, the characteristics are the same. Okay, so as we begin discussing the characteristics of life, please remember that the order is completely unimportant. It just happens to be the order I'm discussing them in. So hopefully you can tell from the picture that our first one has to do something with new life. So our first characteristic of life is that all living things reproduce. When we say reproduce, we mean making new individuals. I hope you knew that. Um, but if you didn't, there you go. The better way of phrasing this is that all living things exhibit a phenomenon known as biogenesis, or the idea that life only comes from other living things. The only way to get a human is to be born from a human. The only way to get a dog is to have a dog in the first place. The only way to have a cell is to come from an existing cell, because life only comes from life. Biogenesis literally means life origin. Our next characteristic of life is that all living things undergo growth and development. Growth is probably obvious. You probably already knew it. Growth means getting bigger. For organisms, most organisms get bigger, not necessarily by getting having their cells get bigger, but instead by getting more cells. Development is a little trickier. Development is change in shape or form. It's very clear to most people that that tadpole has changed as it becomes a frog. That's a pretty profound change. Even with plants, we can see the change as they get different kinds of leaves and uh, plant stems become thicker and sometimes even woody. So that change is really apparent. In some animals, it's a little bit trickier to see as we go from being a baby like a puppy to an adult. There are significant development there. You see the snout gets longer on a dog, there's more white fur. Even behavioral changes would be would be a change in form, uh, the type of development. There's one very important type of development, um, and that is the, the development that occurs in a lot of multicellular organisms as they go from one single embryo, a single cell, fertilized egg, to being a multicellular organism. That single cell has to give rise to all the different kinds of cells, muscle cells, tish, uh, skin cells, heart cells, and so forth. And so that is cellular differentiation that's very, very important in biology. Before we go on to our next characteristics of life, let's take a moment, pause if you need to catch up on your notes or rewind if necessary, and let's take a quick second to review. The next characteristic of life you can see the dog and pant are both doing is responding to stimuli. So um, organisms depend upon their environment, so it's really important that they're able to sense changes in this, the environment and respond accordingly. So in the case of the, the plant, it's growing towards the light because the light is giving it energy. A, a dog would have to respond to an itch because that itch might be something that could endanger uh, an insect that could um, bite it and spread disease or infection. So being able to respond to environment is pretty important. Um, blinking, shedding, seed germination, all of these are initiated by stimuli. Living things also have to respond to internal stimuli, internal changes. When, we, when they respond to internal changes, they're undergoing something called homeostasis. Homeostasis is a process by which organisms maintain a stable internal condition. So, homeo means similar, 
Stasis is a state of equilibrium. That's a word that not everybody understands. So when we say equilibrium, what we mean is a state of rest or balance. So homeostasis is maintaining a similar state of rest or balance. We don't want our conditions fluctuating. That's why when we get too hot, we sweat. When we get too cold, we shiver, among other things. All of those things are important in maintaining our stable internal environment. We do that not only for temperature, but for for the volume of water we have, the, the sugar levels, that's why diabetics who can't maintain the sugar levels have some problems. Uh, the pH of our bodies will do a lab on that. So maintaining homeostasis is incredibly important. Here's a good spot to take a moment and make sure you've got all the notes. Rewind if you need to, and then let's review a little bit. Our next characteristic of life is that all living things have a need for materials and energy. So the act of living uses up materials and energy. So even sleeping requires that we have energy to power our brain and our muscles and our digestive processes. And so everything we do requires energy for that. And our daily cellular activities require that we use up materials. That use of energy and materials comes in the form of metabolism. So metabolism refers to the chemical reactions that take place in our bodies to maintain life. Um, and so that's our exchange. Those chemical reactions are, are literally exchanges of energy and materials. When we talk about that energy, we need to speak for a minute about where it comes from. So hopefully you know that there's really two kinds of organisms. There's the organisms who can make their own energy and the organisms who can't. Organisms who can make their own energy usually do photosynthesis, so their energy comes from the sun. However, there are some that can make their own energy without sunlight. These are the kinds of organisms that would live, for example, in the bottom of the deep sea vents. They can make energy actually out of chemical reactions. Most, um, no, chemical reactions. Animals, fungi, and a whole bunch of other kinds of organisms are all what we call heterotrophs. So in other words, we get energy through predation. In other words, eating another organism. So you're probably familiar, plant gets the energy, we eat the plant, we get the energy. Keep in mind that there's a lot of other materials that we can get from our environment. Um, obviously, we get oxygen from our environment. Plants suck up a whole lot of materials from their roots. Not energy, but a whole lot of materials. Let's take a quick break for review. Our next characteristic of life is the idea that all living things inherit adaptations. That phrase, inherit adaptations, is really important. So an adaptation is a trait that makes you well-suited for your environment, makes you well-suited for what you do in life. So not just that you can survive in the cold, but if you're a predator, it makes you well-suited for being a predator. But the most important characteristic of an adaptation is that it's inherited. So either you're born with it or you're not. It's not something that you can acquire during life. So sometimes we use the phrase, oh, children can adapt. We don't mean that biologically. Children can't adapt biologically because you have to be born with a trait. Let's take a quick second to ask some questions about adaptations. Okay, so now we're getting into some characteristics that are almost unique tonight to life. The next one is all living things are based on a genetic code. So let's back up a little bit. What we're talking about is heredity. Heredity is the idea of passing on traits from one generation to the next. And the way that those traits are passed on is through a molecule known as DNA. DNA is, is simply a molecule that's able to hold the code for genes. So you might hear someone say, oh, you have your mom's eyes or I've got my dad's nose. That's because we, I inherited those traits from my parents when I was born. What's really cool is when we look at living things, whether we're talking about me or a maple tree or a bacteria cell, if we analyze our DNA, there are some very profound similarities shared by all living things. Our DNA is all made up of the same repeating units and just in different order to make our different genes. And a lot of the instructions that I have in my cells for things that, for my cell parts, are found in maple trees, which I think is really awesome. It's also worth noting that just about everything that has DNA is alive. There's, there's a few very notable exceptions, but almost everything that has DNA is alive, which is also kind of cool. Let's take a minute and review. Our last characteristic of life is the thing that is truly unique to life. Only things that are alive or have been alive have this, and that is that all living things are made up of cells. There is nothing that exists that is made up of a cell that wasn't once alive, or still alive, which is kind of cool too. So, cells are the smallest unit of life. 
When we say that, what we mean is that cells are capable of doing all of the other characteristics of life. So a cell can grow. It doesn't grow that much because it has some limitations, but it can grow from being smaller to getting bigger. A cell can develop. A cell has DNA. A cell can maintain homeostasis. A cell has a metabolism. All the things that we discussed are capable in one single cell. So it's the smallest unit. In fact, one single cell can be an organism. Organisms that are made of multi -cell and multiple cells have to have a lot of complexity in order to make those cells work with one another. Because they have that complexity, they need to be very organized to make sure that their cells are able to get all the resources they need and to get rid of all the things they don't need. So that means we need to have organization. So we're going to close this discussion up with how that's organized. Before we move on to organization, organization of life, let's take a minute and review. The last thing we're going to discuss are the levels of organization in an organism. If you're in honors bio, then you don't have a formal spot to put this in your notes. That's okay, just jot down some notes on the back. So the very, very smallest unit of life is a cell, but cells are made up of a whole bunch of stuff. The absolute smallest thing that you can get is subatomic particles. You probably remember this from middle school. So they're the smallest unit of organization, and we have three subatomic particles. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons, neutrons, and electrons are organized into atoms. Atoms are the smallest thing that retains its specific chemical properties. So, for example, an atom of carbon has different chemical properties than an atom of oxygen. Some important atoms that we're going to care about in biology include carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and hydrogen. Atoms are arranged into molecules when atoms are bound, bonded together. So, some important biological molecules that you'll hear about this year are water, glucose, which is a form of sugar, DNA, we already mentioned, RNA is its cousin, lipids, which should be like fats, proteins, you've probably heard of, and ATP, which is an energy molecule that our cells use. Molecules are arranged into structures known as organelles. Organelles literally means little organs. So their molecules are arranged together to perform a function, kind of like organs in our bodies perform functions. Another way of looking at them is teeny tiny cell structures. Together, organelles make up cells. And all those astrocytes are next to cells because, of course, as we mentioned already, it is the smallest unit of life. As I mentioned also, it can do all of the characteristics of life. And... Remember, all life begins as a cell. Let's take a minute and pause and talk about uh, the smaller levels of organization in biology. So cells are organized into tissues. Tissues are collections of cells that have similar structure working together for a function. That's a common phrase you'll see, working together for a common function. So tissues are similar cells working together for a common function. Organs are different types of tissues that work together for a common function. The picture is a picture of a kidney. Kidney is made up of a whole bunch of different tissues working together for a common function. In this case, that function is filtering water and cellular waste out of the blood. The kidney is part of a larger system of organs that work together, once again, for a common function. So it's a group of organs that work together. Here's the digestive tract. The digestive tract is made up of liver, stomach, intestines, small intestines, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And their function is, of course, digestion. And they all work together to achieve that goal. Finally, organ systems are all working together to keep an organism alive. So it's one individual living thing. Remember that an, organ, an organism can be a single cell, in which case we don't have tissues and organs and organ systems, or it can be a multicellular organism that would have those things. As we get larger, organisms of the same type in the same place, another phrase you'll see a lot, are made up of populations. So once again, same type, same place. They have to interact with one another. So here we have a population of sea lions, population of bees, or we can even talk about a population of bacteria. If we consider not just organisms of the same species living and interacting together, but instead all of the organisms 
in a place living and interacting together, what we're describing is a community. So a community, like is the one in this picture, includes the birds that are there, the plants that are there, the organisms in the water, everything from an amoeba, an amoeba population in the water to insects in the water to fish in the water. Every living thing in that picture would make up the community of that pond. Ecosystems then would include not only the living things in a place, but also the physical environment that those living things interact with. So in that previous picture, it would be the water in the picture. It, it would be the air, the wind, the soil, all of those things which have living things in it and they're interacting with. Finally, the largest level of organization is the biosphere. The biosphere is the portion of the earth that has life. So let's review one last time. That's it for this set of notes. If you have any questions, make sure you ask me when you get to class.